the businessman behaves according to the incentives you create if you beha- if you ask him to be corrupt he will be corrupt you know we have high investment we have good technology we have uh, la- land labor but yet we are the one of the poorest countries in the world nobody seems to know how do we actually go out there and let go how do we allocate resources start investing money in knowledge number one and do it seriously I have a veteran panel and we have a very young audience uh, not just sitting here today but uh, since this is beaming across all social media platforms live so I'm going to try and marry some of the very complex issues in the book some of the very deep insights that the panelists have uh, in a way that audiences across the board can understand what the book is about and what the book hopes India will achieve somewhere in the book I thought there was a bit of hopelessness if I may put that to you Uh, and I'm going to read the two lines that suggested to me this. For all of India's rapid development, in spite of all our forays into economic liberalization and international engagement, Delhi has never truly abandoned the cautious, protective, inward-looking mindset that shaped the birth of modern India. Why do you believe that Delhi has not been able to move out of this, this approach, this attitude? And do you really have any hope or what will it take for us to be able to turn that around. Well the second one as I said time. I think we will now need okay. much more time for 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 the kind of change that one uh, thought one would uh, uh, achieve much much more quickly. You know my when I say uh, that we haven't fully achieved our potential I if you read the book I mean if you if you go beyond some of these lines my big disappointment is with the Indian state. I think what keeps India back uh, is the Indian state. Uh, uh, because it is far too interventionist. it is far too micromanaging it is far too suspicious of market forces it is far too uh, uh, suspicious of uh, uh, entrepreneurship uh, and that is a huge problem it is a huge problem well i think the key problem is state capacity in india not just center versus state right but the capacity of the state you know a liberal democratic state is based on three pillars is held up by three pillars one is a strong executive that can get things done second that strong executive's actions are governed by the rule of law and third those actions are accountable to the people now all our energies go into accountability accountability i mean we are in a bloody election mode every month in this country and and so the executive almost has no time to run the country so the issue really comes down to is that the we did economic reforms but unlike britain which faced a similar crisis uh, in in, uh, in 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 the uh, uh, late 70s early 80s Margaret Thatcher you know we think of her as an economic reformer a right wing economic reformer she actually reformed the state, state yeah. and that she did in her second term so this is the second term of mr modi and 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 this at least let's see what what he does i'd like to actually just address the first question that you asked mr jalan um this whole point about why is government suspicious right take the last couple of decades and the efforts that have been made to try and liberalize the economy right so we how do how do we get spectrum in the hands of the telecom companies right do you auction it do you allocate it what is the right way which um, uh, you know which which institution will come back and tell you that you did it wrong and therefore you got to go fix it again send somebody to jail in between you get what i'm saying so you know so a lot of the efforts at trying to ignite the animal spirits trying to bring in say public private partnerships in infrastructure many of these have gone wrong and if you went back to 10 15 years ago it seemed that what resource 
limitation was there with government would be filled by the private sector. And they borrowed heavily, and then we now have this enormous overhang of non-performing assets. So, we've, you know, nobody seems to know how do we actually go out there and let go? How do we allocate resources in a manner that would let companies um, you know, make profits, but as well as add to the larger public wealth that, you know, through which infrastructure really is? So similarly, when you think across domains, right, you have this problem. So that you're in some way agreeing with Raghav, that, that Delhi are. continues to be very suspicious of business, but you're saying that the blame lies on business. I, I, I'm saying it's on both sides. I, it's a, partly it's a systemic problem, is okay. what I would say. I would just add to uh, uh, what, what Rajiv said, you know, about, uh, uh, let's say, the spectrum case. Now, it's a core point that, uh, that I've tried to make in the book over and over again, that we go halfway. Uh, we, we, we never trust market forces completely. So Spectrum is a classical case of first we will do, first we will look at revenue maximization for the government. Is the government a profiteering at, uh, entity? Should it be profiteering? It should be creating public goods. The point I'm trying to make it is an interventionist government which creates these very discretionary uh, arbitrage, discretionary rent seeking. That's the problem. It's not so much the companies which are the problem. It's the system by which you, you do the allocation. Okay. And, uh, Dr. Jalan, I want to come yeah, back. So, but yes, then please. what's the story on the electricity, the example that I just gave you, where whoever got the contract has gone and shafted everyone else? Uh, again, uh, again, so, again. No, I think, you, I'm sorry. But, but using that all, one example I, is... I a, think he's really out of, out of whack because <laughs> it is the, 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 in the businessman behaves according to the incentives you create. Yeah. He's just maximizing the incentive system. If you, behave, if you ask him to be corrupt, he will be corrupt. But if you have a fair system which is transparent, then there's no scope for Mr. it. Mr. Das, you're living in some other world, not in the world that we inhabit. Let me point out to you that this, there is a set of capitalists who use the economy, use the government for their private benefit at the cost of the rest of us. If you haven't woken up to that, I'm, I hope you do by 2050. It's, if you think about CAG, it's also independent. It's also autonomous. And the RBI? Yeah, and the RBI, this is the problem. That if the, if the RBI, you wanted RBI to be autonomous, it is an autonomous institution, but it is linked to the fiscal policy. You see, it is not that it decides fiscal policy, it decides economy, it decides monetary policy, and so on and so forth. Fair or, the, or, or that it decides foreign exchange, that it manages foreign exchange, but it doesn't decide. The, uh, what would be done about the foreign exchange policy? Policy is decided by the central government. So what I'm no, but I mean these are these are, these are very long issues, intricate issues. But the most important point that I want to make to you is that if you look at our fundamentals, we are very very strong. You know, we have high investment, we have good technology, we have uh, la land, labor, but yet. We are the, one of the poorest countries in the world, and yet we are not able to deliver what we, we, what we say we will. Why? Because you are not accountable. Okay. You, know, you, you announce policy, you are not accountable. You talked about you know, policies that have been announced, but you are not accountable. Yeah. Whether you have given it, or you have, you have done it, or you have not done it. Why? So we should not be talking about whether Mr. Modi can deliver to us better education or higher levels of education or better higher levels of health care. We should be talking about how individual state governments do that. No, and if we put more focus on the state ministers, chief ministers, then maybe we'll have better outcomes. But what Mr. Modi can do is what I've called in the book, unmix the economy. We've lived with a mixed, jumbled up economy for 70 years. It may have worked in the 60s and 70s. You've got to unmix the economy. You have to let the the entrepreneurial genius of our people free. The state should do education, health, agriculture, infrastructure, governance. That's it. Now, I, we, we did leave the entrepreneurial freedom of our people free and we ended up with how many lacros and NPAs? Where, where did we leave them free? Where did, we, where, where did we leave? Half the infrastructure projects are stuck because of government approvals. Where did we leave them free? Wherever we've left them free, we have created enormous value, enormous consumer value. Like technology. Like 
wherever we've left them free, the enormous uh, value has been created. I think Raghav's book is wonderfully valuable as a roadmap for that strategy. What do you do with it? How do you go about getting a roadmap though? And here I'm a little more pessimistic even than Raghav. Um, education, you talked about it at great length. We're wonderful at building buildings. So you go to the back of beyond in Chhattisgarh, district Malkangiri, go anywhere, you'll find wonderful school buildings in every Adivasi village today. Right, where there's nothing else. 50 kilometers from the road, there will be a school building. But there will be no teacher in it. Uh, Seema Bansal at the Boston Consulting Group's done some fantastic work on this in Haryana, not very far from Delhi, where she found that most high school teachers at government schools could not pass a fourth standard maths examination. Judges you spoke about, thousands of judges, everyone would agree you need to hire them. I urge you, sir, take a look at third-year law students in Delhi University you'll find that most of them cannot answer a question paper in any language, be it Hindi or English. Uh, Try and read lower court judgments, which I have to do every day, sadly, um, uh, for work. Uh, I struggle to comprehend what the judge is trying to say three quarters of the time. There is a real crisis. What is China doing after uh, their problems with Trump and their trade dispute? They've created 400 new PhD positions to study the United States in China. We have not had a single scholarly work by any Indian author on any state in our neighborhood published by an international press in the last decade. Praveen, we are supposed to figure out how to get there by 2050. (laughs) Start investing money in knowledge, number one, and do it seriously. Two more just really quick points. You spoke about law and order, sir. Again, the simple reason is we don't have any. Our police forces are understaffed across the country and undertrained. Most of these police forces could not investigate a crime if, you know, uh, uh, except with the trusty instrument of beating someone till they confess to whatever it is they can. There are no forensics. There are no advanced training institutes. There's nothing. If you go to Chennai today, you will find Chinese students doing doctoral work in Bharatnatyam because they want to understand how our culture and our polity function. Our finest university, JNU, gives students three months at the end of a PhD to go study in China. You want to know why we are going to fail to be a great power? That sums it up for me. You've got to hand it to the Prime Minister on a couple of uh, issues. Uh, Energy and the ability to take risks. Now, you know, when we talk about Balakot, most of the debate goes around whether we killed or how many did we kill. But that wasn't the issue. The issue was for India to stand up and say, we went in and attacked Pakistan because in retaliation. That's a fundamental change in your foreign policy narrative. Whether you killed one or whether you killed 350, that's immaterial. You have created a new foreign policy paradigm. Uh, And he's done it with America. He's uh, he's Hmm. struck a a, a pretty strong strategic uh, uh, intent there. He's managed to keep Russia, Iran all these relationships reasonably intact. He's managed to also draw fair amount of, uh, not balance, we have a long way to go still, but at least uh, equivalence with China on several issues. So I think he's had a pretty energetic uh, foreign policy. Japan, he's done very, very well. Uh, So, as I said, when when, when he came, we thought he'd do wonders to the economy and and would learn a bit on the foreign policy. I... I, I may be overstating the case, but on economy, he's been really disappointing. Uh, and on foreign policy, uh, I believe he's done much better. <laughs>